Hello, everyone, again. And uh, today I'm going to talk about integrability of the six vertex model. And my name is Slava Naprienko. And uh, this is work in progress. But the second half is going to be about new results. But the first half is going to be a brief overview how six vertex model is useful. So this, this is a very old and very well known results. So let me go to the outline of my, of my talk today. So at first, I'm going to talk a bit about the six vertex model. I just going to really define it and jump further. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Then I'm going to talk about two different classes of applications of the six vertex model. The six vertex model are used in the enumerative combinatorics in order to count alternating sign matrices. And uh, the six vertex model is also used uh, in the theory of special functions when you study some sure polynomial like uh, functions and want to get identities and want to get branching rules and everything like this. And uh, these two applications, they correspond to two different integrability classes that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, then I want, uh, I'm going to talk about the integrability part of this rather than the applications. And this is going to be uh, get, getting me closer to my results. And uh, finally, I'm going to get to the generalizations of the known classes, and I'm going to show what uh, kind of results still hold in the generalizations and uh, what one could uh, hope for. Then I'm going to explain uh, what I mean by generic weights. Um, this is something that I'm going to use in the fifth section of my talk, but I'm not going to explain it till later. But this is very crucial for me, and I would really, really love to spend some time explaining that. And finally, I'm going to have some overview with potential applications and uh, what I think could be done further. So in my talk, I'm not going to explain some of the things that are not going to be useful for people who don't know these things and going to be in, in, you know, uh, too trivial for people who know already these things. So it's going to be a bit shallow in the first several things, but then I'll try to get uh, deeper and get more interesting. So let's start. The six vertex model is very, very old and very, very uh, well studied uh, model where you have, that's how I think about it. You have a part of the rectangular grid and uh, you have paths starting from the top and they can go only down and to the right. And uh, you start with some paths somewhere on the top boundary and then they leave somewhere on the right boundary. And you're looking at this uh, finite piece of the grid and there are different configurations and different states that could be, you know, paths could go all the way down, all the way right, you know, they could cross, they could do different things. And uh, with these restrictions, the model has only six possible states. So we could have something like an empty place. We could have a place where paths intersect, for example, like it's here. We have something that just goes down, like it's here. We see something goes on the right, like for example, here. We see that paths go down and on the right. And finally, from the left uh, down, for example, here. Uh, because there are only six configurations for the vertices, this is called six vertex model. And this notation, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, is a funny one, but it's traditional. It's since Baxter, and we're going to use it because we get stuck with that. So the, what we do with the six vertex model like this, what is the main object of interest for me is the partition function. What I'm going to do is for each state of my model, for example, I fix the boundary, then I have only finite too many states. For each state of my model, I'm going to assign some weight to it. And the weight is going to be assigned depending on what kind of uh, types of vertices I'm going to encounter and in what places. I'm going to show an example right now. And then I'm going to sum all of these weights. So my hope, my hope is that this sum is going to be interesting. And uh, this is what uh, pretty much the entire, the entire talk is about. Can I assign weights to the six vertex model such that when I sum all of them over some boundary condition, my partition function is interesting, is useful, is important, and uh, being um, nice to look at. So let me give you a very, very simple example very briefly so that we are really on the same page. So let me look, for example, at this state. This is two paths. They enter from one and three and leave at one and two. And if I want to write the weight of the state, uh, I see that the first one is of type C1. So it is function C1 but with coordinates one, one. 
Then I have C2, one, two, then I have C1 at one, three. So I'm describing the weights coming from these three vertices. And then I describe the vertices of the second row. So this is A1 to one, this is C1 to two, and this is B2 to three. So this is my weight for this particular state. And these uh, weights I'm gonna sum over some boundary conditions and hope that my partition function is gonna be interesting. Okay, so this is the six vertex model and the partition function. So one of the first and the coolest applications of the six vertex model is the alternating sign matrices. So let me uh, tell you, uh, alternating sign matrix is a matrix with entries which are only zeros, ones, and minus ones. All rows and columns sum to one, and non-zero entries alternate in sign. So it's several conditions uh, that which is you know hard to keep at hand at the same time. So here is an example. All permutations, all permutation matrices uh, count because sum over each row and column is going to be one, and they don't have any minus ones, so it's all fine. Uh, here, there's going to be only one matrix uh, of size three, which is not coming from the permutation. And you can see here that the sum of each row and column is one, and the non-zero entries alternate. So somewhere in 90s, many people were thinking how to count how many of such matrices they are. So the question, which is really important and somewhat tricky, is how many? How many are there? of size n. So this question was surprisingly hard to answer. And at first, there was a huge combinatorial proof that was you know, requiring many, many people to confirm before it was accepted. And, uh, and then uh, Greg Berberg uh, showed a very short and slick proof in 10 pages uh, using the six vertex model. And uh, let me show you how it could be done. So this is you know, a question from enumerative combinatorics. So let, let us look at the lattice models and states where with a so-called domain wall boundary condition. What it is, is basically the simplest condition you can think of. My paths enter from all possible spots on the top and they leave at all possible spots on the right. So they come from everywhere and leave from everywhere. It is kind of the simplest you can think. There are no gaps, there is nothing at all. And it turned out, and this is a fact that I'm not going to talk about, is that the states of with such boundaries are in bijection with alternating sign matrices. You can see that here we have seven of these, and we had seven of the alternating sign matrices as well. In other words, the states of the six vertex model are in bijection with alternating sign matrices. This is great. This is our step towards combinatorics, towards some applications in combinatorics. If we, if we have the, you know, the, uh, the main wall boundary conditions. So the partition function, let me recall you, is the sum of the weights. In particular, if our weight is one, the simplest weight possible, then the sum over all states of ones is going to be exactly the number of alternating sign matrices. And this is the key to solve the problem of enumeration of alternating sign matrices that was done by Craig Berberg in 1995, I think. And this was the, uh, the main idea. If we find the partition function with weight one for each state, then the, by bijection, we're going to find the number of alternating sign matrices. So this is one of the applications. And this is the, the result. The result is really cool. The result is really beautiful. It's some product of some factorials. So we see that the partition function of the six vertex model, even with the simplest boundaries, and even with the simplest weights just being one, could be already very interesting and very enlightening. So, but in order to, to actually do this, we need to find the partition function. And uh, we are in a good shape because in, 1992, Izergin and Karepin, they found the partition function for us. I'm not going to tell you uh, the weights because it's every time very overwhelming when someone writes weights and you don't know exactly what to do with them because you not use them at the spot. I'm just going to say that if you pick weights wisely and they're going to depend on some uh, parameters, x1, xn, uh, y1 to yn, 
then your partition function could be computed explicitly. I'm sorry for bringing this formula right away, right in front of you and just showing you. Uh, it's always scary when someone just shows you a huge formula, but it's important for me because I'm gonna generalize it. So what is important here is that it is mainly determinant, kind of the main part is that the partition function is determinant and it has some products in the denominator. So this is, this is the main parts this is the main parts of this uh, formula. And uh, what Greg Cooper Park noticed is that if you set it just, you know, using this uh, function, this uh, result by Isergin and Karepin, he noticed that if you take Q to be Q per root of unity and you let all XIs and YIs to go to one, then weight of each state is going to be exactly one. And the result is going to be exactly the, uh, the number of our generating sign matrices. And it was great. It was beautiful result. Uh, it was beautiful application of the of the six vertex model and the partition function. The 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 limit here it is not super trivial, but nevertheless elementary. You just have some determinant. You see that this determinant vanishes when you want. Uh, the denominator vanishes when you want, and you you know you can work out uh, how things work and actually get you know the limit. But anyway, what is important? What is the main takeaway? Is uh, six vertex model happened to be useful in the enumeration of alternating sign matrices. When you look just at the matrices, you don't have any structure. They're just matrices, they're just sitting there, you don't have anything at all. But when you look at the six vertex model, because they have the local weights, uh, I'm going to talk about it later, they have some functional relations, they have some integrability inside them. And uh, thanks to integrability, we can find the partition function and then you know, set, for example, some limit and get the weight to be one and solve the problem that otherwise would be very hard. And uh, you know, the original proof of this problem takes at least 150 pages. It's really long and it's really tedious. And this is just 10 pages long. So this is really beautiful. So here is one application of the six vertex model. Simplest boundary, simplest weight, we count alternating sign matrices, enumerative combinatorics. That's, that's pretty. Let's go to the second unless you have questions, which I'm always happy to hear, which I'm always happy to try to answer. Perfect. Okay, let's go to the next application. So let me, <laughs> it, 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 it's a horrible definition. Uh, I'm gonna say that there is some function called Schur polynomial. I really hope that almost everyone knows this, but Schur polynomial is an important function from symmetric functions. You can think about it as a character of uh, irreducible representations of the general linear group. But for me right now, what's going to be important is that you can sum, uh, you can write the Schur polynomial as weighted sum over tableau, over, uh, over semi-standard uh, Yan tableau. Or equivalently, you can write it over the Gjokan Settling patterns. And this is the language that I'm going to prefer. What Gelfand Settling Pattern is, again, I'm not going to give the very precise definition, but it's basically like a monotonous triangle. You enter the values in such a way that each entry lies between the entries on top. So this is my combinatorial data. And the Schur polynomial can be written as a weighted sum over such things. So let me just give a silly example. If I have lambda equals two zero, this is my Gelfand Settling Partons. You see that my top row is fixed. It is exactly my lambda. And then I have here, I can put on the zero, one or two. And uh, this is my weights that I'm not even gonna tell you how to get because it's not to the point. What is, uh, what is important is that the special function could be obtained as the sum over the Gelfand Settling Partons. Okay, and now, if we look at the states of the six vertex model, it turned out that they are in bijection with Galvan Settling Pattern. Here are a few examples. This is 310, and this is where my uh, paths enter the game at 310. This is second row one and zero, and this is where they continue. And the, finally, it's zero, and this is where it goes down. It's easy to convince convince yourself, it's even easier to prove that it is a bijection. And uh, since it's a bijection, it means that, yeah, it's a fact <laughs> that the states of the six vertex model with arbitrary top boundary and everything on the right is full. This is kind of boundaries I'm considering. 
the injection with the Gelfand settling patterns. So again, the, the same idea. My states are in bijection with some combinatorial data, which is important for me. But now, again, I recall that the Schur polynomial is a sum of weighted patterns, and uh, the partition function is sum of weighted states. So if I happen to pick weight of a pattern to be equal to weight of a state, then the partition function is going to represent my Schur polynomial. In other words, I can write my Schur polynomial as the partition function of my six vertex model. I'm not going to talk right now. It's not exactly the point of my talk, but it has many benefits. You can prove all the classical identities, the determinant representation, the combinatorial representation, the Cauchy identity, dual Cauchy identity, basically everything you want, almost. Uh, you can prove using lattice models uh, about your sure polynomial if you represent them as the partition function. And then it turns out that you don't need to restrict yourself to the sure polynomial. If you pick other weights, then you can get factorial sure polynomials. If you pick other weights, you get spherical Whitaker functions. If you get other weights, you get the F lambda functions from a uh, September 2021 paper by Garwal, Berdin, Petrov, Wheeler. So all of these functions, they are practically sum over the tableau, some weighted sums over tableau, and all of them could be represented by this way. And what is important for me here is that whenever you pick these weights to represent a new function, this is my application. You know, I want to represent my function as the partition function and uh, then get all of the uh, identities and all of the results kind of for free. They just fall from the representation. But what is important is that all of these weights, I'm going to explain slightly later, they are so-called free fermionic. So they're not arbitrary. They actually all the time satisfy some relation. So this is what's going to be important for us. So what is the takeaway? Six vertex models are useful for the special functions as well. You can represent special functions as the partition function of the six vertex model. And if you do this, then you can study lots of properties of the special functions using the lattice models. So this is my second application. OK, so let me give uh, an, an overview. Ah, OK, yeah, here is one more page. I, I, I kind of lied to you a little bit. In, in reality, my partition function is not going to be just my special function, but it's going to be different by a predictable factor. And this predictable factor is always having a form of deformed well denominator. And this is really the crucial part of the integrability that is going to be important for me when I'm going to classify integrability classes later. But what, what, what is important is that if you have, again, the domain wall boundary conditions, let me recall you that it is the full conditions. And it's when you have all paths entering from the top and all paths entering from the uh, exiting on the right then your partition function actually factors. It is just some product, very nice product. So this is this is important part for me. Let me get an overview. I'm talking a lot, but uh, I really want to cover these um, two cases. So here is a little table. If I have my six vertex model, then I have two classes. One class of integrability was used to count how many alternating sign matrices they are. This is the class that was started by Baxter. This is called field-free case. In this case, my weights A1 and A2 coincide, B1 and B2 coincide, and C1 and C2 coincide. And the weights, they satisfy certain condition that for all vertices, certain quantity is constant. It is just some integrability, integrability nonsense. What, what I tried to say is that the results about the isergin parapin determinant and the enumeration of alternating sign matrices and the, you know, rep representing your partition function as the determinant, they all lie in this one particular integrability class. It's called field-free. It's started by Baxter. And this is how, in which context we get all of these results. On the other hand, there is the second class called free fermionic. And free fermionic uh, class has only one relation on the weights. So you don't require A1 to be equal to A2, just one relation. And this class is useful for studying special functions 
Domino tilings, which I didn't talk about, but it's another way to do some combinatorics, and the deformed value denominator. And then the partition function is having the form of an explicit product. So here is my two, mentally, two classes, how I can use my six vertex model. On one way, it is kind of combinatorics, enumerative combinatorics, alternate and sign matrices, and my partition function is the determinant. Another class, is it a special functions, it is some value deformed denominators, and my partition function is practically a product or product times the special function. So here is the outline of everything that is, oops, oh, this is an update of iPad and I don't like it. They put the three dots on the top and whenever you click to them, they, it wants to split the screen. Okay, so, so this, is, this is the outline. So, the reason why these two cases work and why the partition function is interesting, why the partition function gives you some interesting values is because the, this, uh, because these particular weights that satisfy the young box equation. And right now I'm not going to tell you what young box equation is because it kind of doesn't, it's not going to be helpful if you didn't know and it's going to be a waste of time if you know, but it is basically some local equation for the weights which ultimately results in functional equation for your partition function. In other words, your partition function is not anything at all. It satisfies some functional equations. And this is exactly the reason why we expect that it should have some nice form. For example, here it has the form of determinant and here it's even easier, it has the form of the product. So uh, if we have the, this Jan Baxter equation, then we have uh, functional equations on my partition function and we have a chance to have it computed explicitly and be useful. So this is my little overview. And now I'm gonna get closer to my results. So my idea was to work backwards rather than think, oh, I want to get a factorial Schur polynomial, what kind of weights should I get? Oh, probably these weights would work. And then I get the factorial Schur polynomials. Or I want to match the alternating sign matrices. What kind of weights I should pick such that, you know, the weight's gonna be one and uh, there's gonna be this uh, bijective correspondence that's gonna be helpful. Rather than target the results, I start from the six vertex model itself and I make the assumption. Let's say that Jan Baxter equation holds. So there is integrability. So there is local equations. So there is a way to get the functional equations. Then just from the fact that the Baxter equation holds, I found integrability classes. It turned out that there are two major classes and they're separate from each other in which, it is, uh, in which integrability holds. And it turned out very nicely that one class exactly corresponds to alternating sign matrices and another class corresponds exactly to the special functions. So, you know, our intuition is great. Our two applications are exactly two integrability classes that uh, are possible in the Jan Baxter equation. The third point is very interesting. I'm gonna talk about it uh, at the end of the talk. I'm, I'm gonna do all of my results with generic weights. In almost all papers, uh, people usually pick some weights you know, I want to have zi plus t, I don't know, zj, or, you know, some particular dependence on parameters, on spectral parameters. Uh, you do some parameterization of your weights and you just pick them. I don't want to pick weights. I want to work with the generic one. I want to just say, let me just work with a1, a2, b1, b2, c1, c2. I don't want to make any choice. I want to work as general as possible. And for this, the most general weights and uh, the most general integrability class, I find the partition functions. And it turned out that one partition function is exactly the generalization of the isergin karepin determinant. And another partition function is exactly the generalization of the deformed low denominator. In other words, these things that were happening before, they fundamentally come in from the right place and they fit very nicely to the picture. Another way to think about what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to squeeze as much as possible from the six vertex model. I assume that there is integrability and I assume that my weights are as generic as possible. What can I get? So I'm, I'm working backwards. I'm trying to get as, as general result as possible. And uh, yeah, let me show, let me show you what, what I got so far. So let me talk about generalizations. Um, 
Actually, you can ask me a question and I'm gonna screen hold. <laughs> Okay, let's go to generalizations. So as I told you before, we had two classes of applications. One class was alternating sign matrices, field free Baxter case, and another was free fermionic. So let's start with the first one. I define a new class, which <laughs> I call general fermionic, and it is a bad name. If you have suggestions, you know, please <laughs> email me because I don't know how to call this class. This class is a generalization of the field-free case. So the field-free case considered by Baxter is sitting inside this class. So let me show you what it is. As in the field-free case, I want A1 to be equal to A2. Okay. But this time, I don't require B1 to be equal to B2. They could be different by, by some factor, by some factor R. And I can uh, pick any C1 and C2. This one is not uh, uh, really important. Again, I want to have some quantity similar to how Baxter had it to be held constant. And this is and this is my integrability class. This is my restrictions on the weights. If R equals to one, or you know B1 equals to B2, and C1 equals to C2, you go back to the field-free case considered by Baxter. But I don't require that. I don't, I, I, I define this more general integrability class that contains the field free case. What is interesting about it is that from physical point of view, it means that my ice model, uh, that's why it's originally coming, my ice model is being in an electric field. The reason why the field free case called this way is because you can invert all the errors and uh, the partition function is going to be the same. In other words, you don't have the electric field around. So even if you replace all the errors, nothing changes. But this the class and this uh, results, they are in the presence of, the, of, of an electric field. So this is uh, some, some, new, some, so, so some new class of results. So since this class contains the field free case, I have a hope that I can compute the partition function because in the field-free case for specific choice of weights, Isergin and Karepin computed the, the partition function as the determinant. And I really want to do similar here. It is really not clear at this point whether it's possible because B1 is not equal to B2 and it could be an obstacle. Maybe it is necessary for the determinant to, uh, to exist, uh, B1 to be equal to B2, but it turned out to be not the case. And here is my pretty much first result here is that in this more general setting, the generalized is again Karepian determinant holds. So this determinant the formula gives you the partition function in the larger integrability class than the field free case. In particular, this gives you the partition function in the case of presence of a field. And uh, let me let me let, let us look at the formula because whenever you see a huge formula, you want to you want to have a look. So this formula again has the determinant, and this determinant is exactly how is again Karepian determinant is. It has the denominator. It is exactly how is again uh, Karepian determinant, and we have this prefactor which is exactly like in the is again Karepian. So it it is you know it matches it exactly. But here is three things that I want to point out about this result. First. This result, again, as I mentioned, outside of the field-free case, there is field, there is an electric field. And this is not free fermionic. To my knowledge, I would be really happy to be wrong. To my knowledge, this is the first result in the presence of a field when the partition function is computed, which is not free fermionic. And free fermionic, we know everything, but you know, this restriction for weights is really, really strong and makes, you know, puts us totally in the direction of the special functions. But uh, here, I don't require B1 to be equal to B2, and it means that I have some field, and I nevertheless can compute the partition function explicitly in the form of determinant. Second, the partition function that I wrote here is for generic weights. If you remember the partition function found by Isergin Karepin, their formula is only for special choice. 
people who are in the field, they probably remember that the typical parameterizations uh, that physics, uh, people in physics like to do, it is some hyperbolic sign of some theta, and, you know, and they basically uh, parameterize the weights in such a way that everything, you know, works very smoothly. And only for this choice of weights, only for this parameterization, uh, they find the partition function. I don't do it. I work with generic weights, so I don't require my weights to have any form. I, I, I get this result for the generic weights. In particular, it gives me way more parameters to play with. Now different weights could uh, uh, obtain different limits, but also all of the old results, since I work with generic weights, if you just pick the weights from, for example, uh, Baxter case, then you just get the Baxter result. In particular, even if you don't go outside of the field free case, it is still a generalization. Even if you work still in the case of Baxter in the field free case, when you have A1 equals to A2, B1 equals to B2, C1 equals to C2, it is still a generalization because it I work with generic weights and not with some particular ones. And I have way more parameters to, to my disposal. And finally, the third remark about this formula is in the in the isergin karepin determinant, in the denominator, the, we have the expression xi minus xj and uh, yi minus y, yj. And uh, this is exactly what makes uh, singularities at the determinant. And that's why when Kuberberg computes the limit, you know, you, he needs to do some elementary uh, transformations. So one, uh, you, you, you might uh, reasonably ask what this bh and bv and uh, I'm gonna say very vaguely, this BH and BV, they are weights of the cross vertices. In other words, when you attach the horizontal cross vertex or the vertical cross vertex, they have weights. And these quantities in denominator, they're actually weights of these cross vertices. Why, why I'm putting any attention to this? What I wanna say is that in the isergin karepin determinant, that each term is actually functional. So it, it, it is not just you know, coincidence that some, some xi minus xj is sitting there. It is actually the horizontal, the horizontal weight of the cross vertices and the vertical weight of the cross vertices. And this is an interesting point because almost always when people work with the six vertex model, they pay attention only to the rows. They attach the cross uh, vertex uh, to the to the rows. You know they go it on the right, but almost never people attach the vertices on the vertical on the vertical edges. But in the domain boundary wall condition, let me remind you that it is just fully fully packed uh, boundaries. Here, the horizontal and vertical directions are symmetric. There is no difference between horizontal and vertical uh, uh, directions. And uh, it means that all statistics that we want to have in the horizontal way, they kind of should enter in the vertical way as well. And, uh, and this is exactly these terms here. These terms, they, you see this V and H, it means horizontal and vertical. And in other words, this formula kind of respects both the horizontal integrability and the vertical integrability. And this is, uh, this is what uh, I, I think that uh, important to understand that this is kind of fully packed boundaries such that you need to use both of the integrabilities in order to get the determinant result. That's why you cannot get a similar formula if you have some sparse top boundary condition. You wouldn't be able to do the vertical cross vertices. But anyway, so this is first result. For the first integrable class, which is more general than the field free case considered by Baxter, I found the generalized as Ergin-Karepin determinant that works for the generic weights. So this is one. Let's go further. Now let's jump to the free fermionic case. Slava, can I ask yep. a quick question? Of course, of course. Uh, does the R appear in the BH or the B check or yeah. the BV? Yeah, that's exactly where it is. Uh-huh. Thank you for, for the question. Yeah, uh, very good question. Since my class is more general, uh, B1 and B2, they're different by this uh, factor of R. And uh, a priori, you don't see it anywhere here in the formula, but it's uh, indeed sitting here. So if you write explicitly how BH or BV in terms of weights, R is sitting there. So this is how it depends on the field. 
you can actually you know see dependence on the field it's continuous dependent on the field and when r equals to one field disappears you turn into field free case okay so let's jump to the free fermionic case so for free fermionic case i didn't extend the class it is already as large as possible but what i did is i worked with the generic weights and this is again something new because uh, as i told you before people usually pick weight they say, if I pick these weights, I get short polynomial. If I pick these weights, I get factorial short polynomial. If I pick these weights, I get spherical Whittaker function. If I pick these weights, I get F lambda from the Agarvalber Dean Petrov Wheeler. And uh, for each parameterization of the weights, you get some particular function. But I didn't want to do this. I wanted to work with the generic weights. I wanted to squeeze as much as possible from my six vertex model without making any choice. I just want to use the integrability and I don't want to use any particular choices. And uh, this is my result in the free fermionic case. In the free fermionic case, the partition function with the boundary, uh, with the domain wall boundary conditions is having the explicit form of the deformed well denominator, which is exactly what I was talking about before. And again, you can see here that both horizontal and vertical integrability enters the game. So we, if you again consider the boundaries packed, then it is symmetric. So whatever integrability you have over the horizontal direction should be the same over the vertical one. That's why you should have the statistics of both dimensions, of both directions. Uh, it's not in the archive yet. I hope to write it very, very soon, but I would be happy to discuss. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's work in progress. But uh, the program uh, in Wolfram Alpha and in Sage uh, confirms everything. <laughs> okay. But uh, since people are usually interested uh, about special functions here, uh, if we pick the arbitrary top boundary condition and not the packed one, so not the domain boundary condition, but you know the top is uh, arbitrary, defined by some lambda, some partition, then it turned out that the partition function is the product of the deformed well denominator. And this function, which is, you can't even imagine how much it behaves like sure function. This function behaves in every possible way how should function. It has the determinant expression. It has the description in terms of tableau. It uh, has the double alternant uh, Jacobi identity. It uh, satisfies the determinant identities in terms of the symmetric, uh, elementary symmetric functions. So basically, it is as sure as possible. But th this time, it's done for generic weights. In other words, if you pick any particular weights, you get all the functions that you knew from before. If you pick weights, you get factorial sure pick weight, you know, you get uh, any uh, spherical Whitaker function. But I do it for generic weights. And for the generic weights, I define this, what I temporarily called like free fermionic sure function. I don't know if it's a good name, but <laughs> it is kind of as general sure function, sure like special function as possible to define in the context of the six vertex model. And uh, it's worth another talk, and I hope to give another talk on this topic because uh, this function satisfies everything you can think of, and you have the Cauchy identity, and you have f and g analog of the functions that you know you can pair together, and you can use the non-intersecting lattice models to give very slick proofs for the um, Jacobi Trudy identities. So basically, you know, this function alone, what I call free fermionic sure polynomial, is worth you know. A talk and hopefully I'm going to give it. But since uh, today I'm talking just about integrability, I'm not going to jump into that. From integrability point of view, what is important is that in another integrability class, my partition function can be computed explicitly and it's computed as the very explicit product. All these things, it is you know just very, very explicit things in terms of weights. And I do it for generic weights. So you know as general as you can want to. So yeah. Yep. Can I ask a question? Of course, of course. Uh, just, just maybe for your announcement. Uh, is it possible to get McDonald's polynomials? What yeah. polynomials? McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> no, that's that's a fantastic question. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't have quite enough stretch uh, to mm -hmm. give you because uh, McDonald's polynomials they are written as the sum over the uh, uh, Gelfand settling patterns, but uh, their statistics is not local. When you, mm -hmm. uh, when you consider the coefficient in the branching rules, the, the statistics is actually global. And because of that, you need to have some global parameter running. It could be obtained either by considering the 
uh, six vertex variation on the cylinder, then you can kind of have the global statistics running around and then it would work. Or you need to consider something like um, bosonic, bosonic high spin, higher spin bosonic models where you have uh, packed uh, powers of cues and you kind of squish them together and then you have the colored models. But here it's not enough. Uh, okay, thank you. This sounds very interesting. I hope yeah. we can discuss later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you if you consider the bosonic model, which is my sec uh, next project, you can get a whole little wood story of everything that I told you. You can get integrability classes and so on of whole little wood story, and then it's very interesting to, you know, get them together and uh, finally get to the McDonald in the very natural way. But anyway, so I introduced two integrability classes. One is general fermionic, bad name, and another is free fermionic, good name. And for each of them, for the most general weights possible, I found the partition function. But here is a little trick. Ah, uh, yeah, OK, sorry. I, uh, th there is a couple of things I wanted to talk about. So first, yeah, I told you the most generic weights, not repeating myself. Second, everything in terms of weights, that's great. Uh, the third point is actually quite interesting. So this is something that I haven't seen anywhere before. But the free fermionic case actually is not that different from the field free case or from the uh, general fermionic case that I define. It turned out that in the when you evaluate the partition function, in the middle of your com computation, you find the determinant, which is suspiciously looking like the uh, isergin karapin determinant. It is almost identical. You just need to put B here, and then it would be isergin karapin but without B, it turned out that this determinant could be computed explicitly. And it is a generalization of the Cauchy determinant, of the Cauchy matrix. And uh, let me compare. So here, this is the determinant that happens in the free fermioni case, and this is the Cauchy, uh, Cauchy matrix. You see that here you have the product over the horizontal and the vertical things, and here you have the product over the horizontal and vertical things. Here you have the product over all entries, and here you have the product over all entries. So exactly, you know, exact match. So it turned out that when you compute the partition function in free fermionic case, because of the free fermionic condition, you can compute the determinant explicitly. And so my message here, I guess, or my understanding is this is the reason why free fermionic case is easier than the general fermionic. In the general fermionic case, you get the determinant, is argin karapin determinant, and you cannot do much about it. It is very bulky and it's very hard. Even if you do homogeneous limit, it takes a lot of a lot of work. But in the free fermionic case, this complexity of the determinant it vanishes because the determinant can be computed explicitly and it just factors very nicely. And because of that, your partition function with the domain uh, goal boundary condition is so simple. It is just a product just a product of cross weights. You know, you couldn't hope for better thing. So this is, in my opinion, why free fermionic case is easier than the general fermionic. Gen general fermionic is way harder. And when you work with this, you feel that it is harder. It doesn't give you <laughs> things that easily. So, okay. I, I, keep, I keep talking about this generic weights. And uh, everyone who who work with these things, they uh, probably have suspicion, you know, you cannot just work with generic weights, right? Because if you pick just generic weights, you know, nothing's gonna work. You, you know, you need to have something about your generic weights. So, but it turned out that it is not even enough. For example, in the free fermionic case, it is not enough that each vertex has the free fermionic condition. It is still not enough. Let me show you, let me explain what I mean. The main application of the Jan Bax's equation that, you know, everyone uses everywhere, <laughs> is the transfer argument. You attach cross vertex on the left, you do step after step, and then it goes all the way to the right, and you get the functional equation for your partition function. This is something that you know everyone does already in sleep now because we've worked so much about it. But the trick is that it's actually an additional assumption. This assumption does not come from integrability. Integrability uh, touches only, only a local equation. But here we secretly are asking a global equation. I want my local equation to be repeated many times. And at each time, it, it works with every next column. In other words, my cross vertices, they should be column independent in order for this trick to, 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 to work. 
because if they depend on the column, every time I have another vertex, you know, my new vertex doesn't work with the second column. I cannot make the second step. In other words, when people work with the lattice models, they always secretly choose weights such that the cross vertices don't depend on the columns. That's the only way how to make these uh, arguments work. And uh, that's the only way how to get functional equations. And this is you know, what people do again and again. When you, pick, when you pick even very, very general parameterization of your weights, when you have parameterization by many parameters, you want to in include as many as possible, you still pick your weights in such a way such that uh, cross vertices or weights of the R matrices, they're not gonna depend on the column. Speaking uh, in a different language, this is how you get the quadratic equations for the algebraic beta ansatz for the row transfer matrices. If you wanna get anything about row transfer metrics, you know, you'd rather, you, you know, you want to have the entire row involved, not just the local equation. So in other words, everyone secretly assumes this, the transfer argument is possible when they pick the weights, but I don't want to pick the weight. I don't want to pick weights. And so what I do is that I, I put it as an assumption. I say, let's just assume that my cross vertices don't depend on the column and the vertical don't depend on the row. So rather than you know, trying to pick weights such that it's gonna hold, I just make it as an assumption. If I have this assumption, then all my functional equations work. If I have this assumption, then all the methods from every paper that you know, we're reading work because it is exactly what we need. We exactly need this transfer assumption in order for the functional equations to be obtained, in order to have the draw transfer matrices, uh, quadratic relations, in order to use anything at all. We don't uh, consider the local integrability. We secretly actually want to have the transfer assumption. And, but, and this is one of the uh, most, I don't know, my, 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 one of my uh, favorite parts here is that what I do, if I assume the transfer assumption, I notice the following thing. If you have a lattice model and you have a weight sitting somewhere here, for example, on the third row and on the second column, using with uh, assuming that you have an assumption, using the horizontal cross vertices, you can. This, this weight jumps here, and then uh, using another one, using another one, you can make your weight jump to the first row. In other words, by using the transfer, the, the cross vertices, you can express your weights on any row in terms of the first row. There is you know, subtle existence of solution, but this is, this is the idea. If you have the uh, tr uh, transfer assumption, then actually all the weights on all the rows are expressed in terms of the first one and the cross vertices. But I have also the vertical ones. So if I attach the vertical here, I can express this one in terms of corner. And I can express, in other words, I can express any weight whatsoever in my entire model in terms of the corner weights at one one and the, the cross vertices. And it turns out to be the key. This, is, this turns out to be the key because this is, gives you the parameterization. This gives you the parameterization of the weights that satisfy the transfer assumption in the most general case kind of possible. So what I uh, kind of a result is that the transfer weights, this is how I call these weights when they satisfy the transfer assumption, they admit explicit parameterization. You can just pick the corner weights, you know, corner, you can pick anything you want. And, and you know, it's a very interesting idea here because you parameterize your weights in terms of Jan Baxter equation, in terms of their cross vertices weights. Usually it happens vice versa. Usually you have some weights given, you know, by the problem. And then you think, what is my R matrices? You know, ah, yeah, my, my R matrix is gonna be, you know, designed like this. Here I invert the thing. Rather than start with, uh, weights and then get the R matrices, I do vice versa. I use the arbitrary parameters for my cross vertices weights and express my weights in terms of them and the corner. So this gives me as general weights as potentially possible to have the transfer assumption. In other words, in all situations when you can use the functional equations, this is, this is what kind of weights you're gonna have. And let me give you a little uh, 
a little interesting uh, uh, example of application of this thing. I told you before that uh, there is this generalized Cauchy determinant. So now, since I can parametrize my weights in the most general way, uh, in the most in the most general way possible, here is uh, an interesting determinant identity. This determinant identity generalizes some of the identities from the advanced determinant calculus and from some of the papers of Akada. So basically, it is just nice general general determinant identity. So look how many parameters you have. You have the corner weights. You can think about this A1, A2, B1, B2 as the weights of your corner. Then you have the horizontal A's and B's. This is two kinds of the cross uh, vertex, horizontal cross vertex weights. And then you have two kinds of the vertical A, A and B. In, in total, you have uh, four N plus four parameters. Meanwhile, in the, in the Cauchy determinant, you have only two N. You have only X1 to Xn and Y1 to Yn. But nevertheless, with this huge generality, the determinant of, of, uh, of the values that I'm gonna define right now is computed explicitly. And this is exactly matches the generalized uh, Cauchy determinant. And I'm gonna write here the formulas just uh, for you to, to, to see how parameterization works. So basically this is a weight on arbitrary point and you can see here that this expression brings me to the first to the first row by using the columns. G is index of the column. So by using the G, I can bring it to the first row. And then here out on outwards, I can use I's to bring it to the corner. I know that it is uh, too, too far and it's uh, 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 an idea on its, on its own, but the main, the main point I'm trying to make here is that by parameterizing you weights as general as possible, every identity turns into a very big family of identities. And here we have this extremely general form of the Cauchy determinant that works for all these parameters. Once you know this formula, you can prove it by, by the condensation method. Anyhow else. And uh, this, this, uh, this identity is, ah, uh, this update five. Uh, this identity is, uh, in particular, gives you the, does it work? Yeah. In particular, this uh, identity gives you the evaluation of the F lambda functions from uh, Agavalberg and Petrov Wheeler at zero, which is used for the Cauchy identity. They use the Jacobson, I don't remember the, the condensation method basically to compute this thing. And uh, here uh, it's coming uh, basically from the partition function, kind of from the partition function with the domain boundary of all conditions. So these results, they match many of the things that you can find in different papers. But this parameterization is as general as possible. Okay, so finally, let me give an overview. I started with the assumption that the advanced equation exists. It turned out that it exists in two cases. It's either general fermionic case or free fermionic case. For each of the cases, I found the most general weights possible such that transfer assumption works. Transfer assumption is exactly the assumption I wanna have for the functional equations. So in the most general existence of the integrability, I'm trying to get the most general weights possible such that uh, the transfer assumption works. And I find the partition function in this generality. In other words, I tried to squeeze as much as possible from the six vertex model and I squeezed all I could. <laughs> I don't know how much more general you can make it because I found all the cases when the box equation exists. I just have you know exhausted, exhausted list. And uh, I have exactly the weights for which the transfer assumption works. So now at this point, you can just you know take some of the papers and just you know pick their weights and then you know you get basically the evaluations and the results and things like this. So now it's kind of very, very general weights results. So let me talk about possible applications because uh, the original uh, six vertex model had applications and it would be really nice if these generalizations would have applications. So one thing is refined alternating sign matrices. If you have the weight one for each of the state, then you just count how many of them. But you can easily imagine that if you put some different weights, then you can uh, have a weighted sum of the alternating sign matrices. 
And people do this kind of business for the last 20 years. It's called refinements, refined, refined alternating sign matrix conjecture, when you have some things fixed or some sum fixed, and you try to get you know, more precise ways to count these alternating sign matrices. Now, with the generalized zergin karapin uh, formula that I have, I have that B1 is not necessarily equal to B2. In particular, it means that I can uh, separate and differentiate different kinds of zeros in the alternating sign matrices. So I can get a better, I mean, potentially, this is part that I haven't done. Everything else was done. Everything else is written down. This is, you know, speculations. But now we can differentiate two kind of different sides of zeros in the alternating sign uh, matrices and get a refined results about them. And also, since I have, you know, way bigger uh, parameter, uh, parameter space, it's possible that you can get use of some orthogonal polynomials, but I'm not going to them. Another thing is that from the paper uh, of September 2021, a uh, similar thing was done for the very, very general, very, very general parameterization of the weights for the free fermionic case and the functions f lambda were defined. The f lambdas are pretty much exactly the partition function that I was describing. So it has the form of the uh, well deformed product times sure like function. And these functions, together with other functions, were used uh, to define some determinantal processes. Uh, and uh, you can study some pr probability there. So now I can define this f lambda functions for generic weights. I didn't, I don't need to make any parameterization. I don't need to pick a parameterization. I just have it, you know, what six vertex model can offer. And uh, it's interesting if it's still possible to do the determinant processes in this generality where you don't need to make any choices, where you don't need to make a choice of weights, where you don't need to parameterize them in a certain way. You just have it as general as possible. The minor tilings and asymptotics, uh, asymptotics, it is something that I know people use, but I haven't looked at. But it seems like free fermionic models are associated with domino tilings. And uh, in limit, you can find something. And I don't know much more about it, but uh, hopefully someone does. Uh, large integrability classes of the colored analogs of the six vertex model. That is another interesting topic. So the six vertex model is old. When, you know, it's uh, decades and decades and decades, and it's well understood. But the colored analogs of the six vertex models are pretty new. And it turned out that the integrability classes for the colored models, they kind of come from the uncolored one. In other words, integrability classes for the colored six vertex models actually could be just derived from the classes that I described. And then it means that we can uh, give the total exhausting list of what we can get from the colored lattice models. This is something that I worked a bit uh, about, and uh, it is in particular Ivahori Whitaker functions. It is one of the ways that is coming from free fermionic case. So it's very interesting to see what comes from the general fermionic case when you do coloring. I don't think anyone looked, and I think that might be interesting. So another thing is that I told you that I can define this new kind of sure functions. In particular, with a very nice symmetric choice of weights, I found I, I defined something that I call for now double factorial sure functions, which look very good. They look just like natural generalization of the factorial sure polynomials, and but they have kind of two sets of parameters. And again, for them, you have determinant expression, you have the expression like Jacobi Trudy, basically all the kind of things like this. And I haven't, I tried to find in the literature this class of sure polynomials, but I couldn't find it anywhere. But using the six vertex model, you can define it and all the properties are for free. Uh, another uh, potential application is thermodynamical limit. In the case of the field free case uh, with the domain wall boundary conditions, uh, it was found by uh, Posen, Justin, and uh, Karepin in 2000. And uh, it is basically you know, the asymptotic and uh, how it depends, how the bulk energy depends on the boundary. But they worked in the field free case. And this is the first time, uh, to my knowledge, that uh, you can consider the presence of a field. So you can consider your model uh, in an electric field. And it's very interesting to see if thermodynamical limit changes if you have the field, if you have the dependence on the, uh, you cannot just inverse the errors. So this is another thing that uh, would be interesting to look at. And finally, this is, uh, this is more speculative, I guess, but 
Uh, if you if you forget about the global integrability and just consider the local integrability, maybe it's possible to define some interesting stochastic six, six vertex models with this very gener uh, generic weights, but it is not necessary that the transfer assumption holds. Maybe it's fine that when you jump from one vertex to another, you change the set of weights, but uh, as far as it is integrable at each side, you can still do some probability. I didn't look too much into stochastic six vertices, it's my fault, but I really hope that it's possible to do something with this uh, more generic integrability classes. And this is all I have for today. Thank you.